Hey family, my name is Chris. I am your home gamer dad, and today I'm going to be showing you a game that features a fairly well-known dad in the world of video games. Definitely one of the coolest dads I've ever seen, and one that I absolutely inspire to be one day. So, for those of you out there that have possibly played this game or know anything about it, string your bows, sharpen your axes, and jump into the role of Kratos as I teach you today how to play God of War, the card game. As with all of my how to play games, if there's anything specific that you're interested about in the game, be sure to check out the chapters, which will be in the timeline or the description down below. And of course, feel free to ask me any questions in the comments section, into which I will answer to the best of my ability. But for now, let's take a closer look at this epic journey through a land of myths and monsters. Designed by Alex Olenu and Fel Barros and published by Simon, God Award the Card Game is a cooperative deck builder that can be played with one to four players. The players take on three quests called Scenes, defeating enemies and solving puzzles, all while increasing their own abilities. The first two scenes deal with special events and battling a variety of enemies, while the last scene is the ultimate challenge of the final boss. Conquering the three scenes means winning the game. However, should all the heroes fall, then the game is over, and only the destruction caused by Ragnarok remains. To begin setup for any two to four player game in God of War the card game, each player picks one of the five heroes to play as. I'll be going over solo mode later in the video. You can check the chapters in the timeline or description for a quick jump to get there. But for now, here are the choices and how they function. Kratos. Kratos is the main character of the entire God of War series. In this game, he's a fairly balanced character. He uses the Leviathan Axe as his main weapon, which is mostly what these melee attacks are, but it can be used as a long-range weapon as well. He has a pretty decent amount of shield cards in order to block damage, along with several modifiers in order to increase any of his damage or defense. Each character has a unique Rage ability, which they will charge as they play cards throughout the game. For Kratos, he has Spartan Rage, which will enhance his next attack by three points, as well as heal himself for three. Atreus. Atreus is Kratos' son and companion during their journey across the realms. Atreus' main attacks are long range, as he is a bow user. So as you can see, he has mostly long range attacks, but does not hesitate in order to jump into the fray in order to deal some melee damage. He does have a few defensive cards for him in order to be able to protect himself, but a lot of modifier cards in order to be able to increase the power of his arrow shots. His rage ability, Thunderbird, deals two damage to up to two enemies on the field, enabling him to pick off weaker enemies or dwindle the health of stronger ones. Two things to realize with this. Number one, this is not an attack, so there will be no cards to enhance it. But in addition to that, number two, the enemies do not roll a guard dice against it. And it actually says right there, cannot be blocked. Mimir. The talking, quick-witted head that appoints himself as kind of a guide for Kratos and Atreus throughout their journey. In this game, Mimir is 100% a support character. That's what all of these purple cards here. And I'll go over card styles a little bit later. But purple cards can be played at any time during any ally's turn and will do things to enhance their healing, their attack, or various other effects. Mimir also has a few defensive cards for himself, as well enhancement cards that he can add to his support cards to further increase those stats. Mimir is very unique in that he doesn't actually occupy a space on the board. Instead, he connects to a character, think like he's hanging from their belt or something like that, like he is in the game, and moves along with them from space to space. When the character that Mimir is attached to takes damage, Mimir instead may take damage, picking away either his defensive cards or at his main health. If a hero carrying Mimir is knocked down, which is their health reduced to zero, Mimir will stay wherever he is until the next round, in which then he will attach to another character. If Mimir is the last character in the game, unfortunately then it is game over. On Mimir's turn, he skips the hero activation step and goes directly to the scene activation step, which I'll explain about the phases of a turn a little bit later. Mimir can never directly attack an enemy, but is allowed to trigger interaction spots should he have the cards enabled to do it. Finally, Mimir's Rage ability, Knowledge and Wisdom, gives the player some mitigation over the upgrade deck. This actually gives them the ability to see and adjust what cards are coming next, so this way they can choose what upgrades they want or what enemies actually activate. Freya, the Sage of the Forest and a Powerful Witch. 
Freya's deck options are very balanced. She has several long range abilities and a few melee, along with several support techniques in order to help her allies throughout the battle. In addition, she does have the ability to defend herself, in addition to various modifiers. What makes Freya powerful is her rage ability, Old Magic. This allows her to prevent all incoming damage from a single source to any hero. Keep in mind, she only has a limit of two tokens and cannot place another token if both are in play. She may place tokens on herself and multiple tokens on a particular character. But as soon as they are on the field, they must be used before she can activate her old magic once again. Finally, we have Brock and Sindri, the Holdra brothers, blacksmiths and weapons and armor masters. A single player actually controls both of these characters during the game. Each character can move once each round and can occupy spaces as normal. The player's hand is the same as all the others, drawing up to their hand limit during the preparation phase. When playing their various action cards, they must declare which one of the brothers is taking the action and will only raise their meter based on who it is that they declare is doing whatever it is that they're playing. Their deck has a decent spread of abilities to it, a lot of melee and some range attacks, their defense, and then they also have support techniques that they can use to heal their other allies in addition to each other. When using their rage abilities, the listed effect can be used for either of the brothers, but no other characters. So Brock's gear up can be used to either increase his defense by three or Sindri's, while Sindri's weapon eyes can be used to increase or to do a range attack for three damage or for Brock to do a range attack for three damage. If one of the brothers is ever knocked out, the other one will continue playing as normal. Once a player has made their choice, they're going to take their character card, their matching 15 deck starter deck, their standee for the character, any associated tokens, which in this case is just Freya and her special tokens, and then they're going to take a rage marker and put it on the zero part in their rage meter. Once everyone has made their choices, it's time to set up their quest line. In order to win God of War the card game, you have to complete two main quests along with defeating one final boss. Separate them into the two piles. All the final bosses will have the word final boss on them and the rest of the quests will not. So just separate them and then shuffle them together and you are going to actually start laying them down in an inverse pyramid style. So you're going to take the first card and put it down on the bottom here and then you're going to take two more cards and put them right up top. You're then going to take the four boss cards, shuffle them and place them up here three in a row. This represents your progress through the game. Any additional boss and scene cards go back to the box. The first quest that players will be tackling will be the very bottom card of the pyramid. The number in the upper left corner of the quest card corresponds to the scene that you're going to be using. Go into the box and you're going to find the scene cards that have the matching number right up here. You're then going to use the stack of cards that all have that same number in order to set up the scene. Uh, as for the rest of the cards, just leave them to the side for right now. We will get back to them once we are done with this quest. To set up the scene, you're going to be placing the cards in two rows, a top row and a bottom row. The order in which they are placed are actually showed by the diamonds across the bottom or the top of each of the rows. For the initial setup, you're going to use the side with the white diamond and place them from left to right as shown in the order on the card. So if the far left spot is a white diamond, then that's where this card goes. If it's on the bottom, it goes on the bottom side. So it's a far left top, it goes here. Second one in, goes here, and so on and so forth until you form the full scene in which the battle will be taking place. Possibly one of my favorite features of this game and how it actually comes together and forms a really cool picture. Next, you're going to want to put into reach several piles of things for players to get their hands on. First, you have the upgrade deck. This massive deck here has all the cards that you're going to be using in order to upgrade your decks as you go along with the game. But in addition to that, this deck is also how the enemies are going to attack you. Shuffle this and place this within reach of the players. You're then going to go look for the various status cards that you're going to have for the game. In this case, it's the poison cards and the stun cards. Just leave these to the side. They'll be used at various points throughout the game. And then you're also going to want to take the shattered crystal cards here and place them alongside the other stats. 
Token wise, you're going to want a pile of common tokens. That's these are the ones with the God of War Omega symbol on them. Enemy defeated tokens, which has this little skull on them. Draw modifier tokens that basically show you if you're allowed to draw additional cards or you draw less cards on your turn. Some stun tokens in case Atreus or somebody has an ability in order to stun enemies. And then you're going to want to have a pile of health tokens, which come in three flavors. 10, 5, and 1. There's a lot more tokens than this within the game. I'm just putting this in here in order to show you basically you know, what the piles are going to look like. The player who most recently played God of War, or however you wish to choose it, takes the first player Leviathan Axe and then places their figure on any one of the open spaces in the board. In clockwise order, players will then place their figures down as well, knowing that at most only two figures can be placed in a space on the board. You're now ready to start playing and defending the realms. As mentioned before, the object of the game is to get through three scenes defeating the final boss at the end of the game. As a cooperative game, the players either win or lose together as a group. The players lose if either, one, all heroes are knocked out in a single scene. That would be every hero's health is reduced to zero. Or two, they satisfy a particular quest losing condition. Not all quests have losing conditions to them, but quests do have specific win conditions tied to them. For this particular setup, which is scene 5, Alfheim, the winning condition is to defeat the main guy here, who I cannot pronounce, and to defeat the Hive. Once both of these objectives have been met, the characters have won, and this particular quest has been completed. Play happens over a series of rounds, each round consisting of four phases. These phases are 1. Preparation. 2. Activation, both the hero and the scene. 3. An extra scene activation. And 4. The upgrade. Let's start at the beginning. Phase 1. Preparation phase. Each player draws from their deck equal to their hand limit. This starts at 7 in the beginning of the game, but there are effects that can raise or lower that limit. To represent that, you have a token here which shows either you are able to draw an additional card for your hand limit, or your hand limit is reduced by a single card. This could also be up to two or down, or it depends on however you, whatever you draw and what certain enemy effects are. If you go to draw from your pile and there is nothing left, you're going to reshuffle your discard pile to make that the new deck and then continue drawing up to your hand limits. Again, this is something every player does in the beginning of the preparation step. These cards will then carry over for the remainder of the round until the next preparation step when you redraw back up to your hand limit. Activation phase. Starting with the first player, each player is going to take a turn going through the activation stage, which has two steps to it. Step one is the hero activation. Step two is the scene activation. Once all players have had a turn in the activation phase, the activation phase ends. On a player's hero activation turn, they can do the following in any order. Moving. A hero can move to any column with at least one free space on it. Each column can hold up to two heroes, each occupying either the front or the back space. When moving into a column with another hero, you can choose whether to have the front or the back space for your character to land on. The purpose of this is because whoever is in the front space will be the one taking whatever attack an enemy has on this particular column. Instead of moving from a column, a hero may also use their move to swap positions with whatever other hero is in the row with them. One last note, Mimir does not count for hero limit to the spaces, as he is attached to a particular hero. But if that hero moves to a space and is a Mimir is attached to them, Mimir will move along with them. Playing action cards. The hand of cards each player draws during their preparation stage are their action cards. A player may play as many cards and sets as they wish, or at least able to, during their turn. Some cards can only be played on the player's turn, while others during scene activation. After resolving each action, the played cards or sets are discarded into the player's own discard piles. Players may openly discuss cards, actions, and strategies together. Action cards come in a variety of different flavors. Cards with the axe symbol on it that have a red color to them are melee attacks and can only be used to hit enemies directly in front of the hero. 
The arrow symbol that has the yellow color to them are ranged cards, able to hit any enemy in the column in front of the hero, not just the space in front of it, but also the space behind it. The shield cards that have the blue colors to them are used during the scene activation and are used to reduce damage for any incoming attacks. The black cards with the numbers on them are simply called number cards and are used to enhance things, building up strength for an attack or increasing defense. Purple cards that actually don't have any symbol on them are support cards and do a whole variety of different effects. In addition to that, there are cards that are even combined of other cards. For example, here Kratos can either use this as a melee or a ranged attack with a starting strength of 1, or he can use this card as a ranged attack, or he can modify something else for an increased damage or defense of 1. What's important about the number cards and all the modifiers is in order to be able to play a melee, a ranged, or a shield card, it must be accompanied by one or more numbers to enhance it. So you could not play this card by itself in order to attack an enemy. You would need to play this card in addition to something that enhances its abilities. The only time a card like this can be played alone without an enhancer is through an interact action, which I'm going to go over later. If a player uses a card with multiple options on it, they must announce which one of the options will be used, cannot use both, and purple cards can be used at any time or when specific conditions are met. Attacking an enemy. A hero can attack an enemy from the column they are in. Enemies in the front row, closest to them, can only be hit by melee attacks, while range attacks can either hit the front row or an enemy that happens to be in the row behind them. To declare an attack, a player will play a specific type of attack card. In this case, it's a melee attack, so he's going to be attacking the front guy here. And this has an attachment of two already, so this is a power of two. They may enhance the ability even more by playing number cards, thus increasing the damage output of the attack. So in this case, going up against this guy right here who actually has 3 health, Kratos is doing an attack of 4. After an attack has been declared and the total number modifiers have been chosen, the player then rolls the enemy die to determine how much damage is blocked by the enemy. You're going to reduce the amount of the attack by the dice roll to get the final total. In this case, 2. So 2 damage is reduced from this attack, meaning that this enemy only takes 2 hits. Place heart tokens equal to the damage amount given on either the enemy or directly on an indicated health space for larger foes. Damage is cumulative, so it carries over to the next attack. Meaning that these go to Kratos' discard pile, and that he may then choose to play another card, in this case another, he's going to use the melee side of this, and then enhance it by 3, thus trying to do another 4 damage to the enemy in front of him. The enemy rolls the dice and reduces the damage by 1, still making it high enough in order to bring the enemy down to 0. Once damage tokens are equal to or greater than the health of an enemy, the enemy is defeated. Scene cards will often have different effects to what happens when enemies are defeated. If they have not been tied with any icon on the board, in which case this one is right down here, they simply just get a death token on them and will take no further actions for the remainder of the scene. However, if there is a specific icon on here, in which case we see the skull here, which means if this enemy is defeated, this card then flips over and the player follows the instructions on the back. All scene cards are double-sided and most of them will have additional enemies or additional effects on the back of them once certain conditions are met. Armor. Some enemies have armor protecting them. Their health cannot be reduced to zero until their armor is gone. In order to destroy the armor, the player has to perform a single attack that is equal to or greater than the armor value shown. Enemies do not roll the enemy dice if they have armor that's being attacked. Also, if enemies have two armor icons, like this guy right here, you have to destroy the one with the greater value before destroying the one with the lesser. Once you have destroyed an armor, best way to do that is to use one of the common tokens to cover it up. So this way you know which ones you have defeated and which ones you are on to next. Also, just as an example with this particular character, he has a flip condition where once you destroy all of his armor, this card flips over, revealing something else on the other side. Rage Abilities Each hero has a unique rage ability that charges when a player plays a card with the rage symbol on it. When the card is played, 
the rage meter will increase by one. As the player plays more cards with rage symbols on it, the rage meter will continue to increase. Once it reaches the end, it will no longer increase until the player uses the ability. At any point during the player's turn, they may choose to activate the rage ability, performing its effects on the card, and then setting the track back to zero. Interact. Some scene cards feature special elements called interaction spots. These spots allow the player to interact with the scene in order to cause a variety of effects. Each spot has its own requirements and a hero in the matching column may choose to discard the required cards in order to trigger the effect. Discarded cards do not increase rage meter. So even though I'm going to be using this card with a rage effect on it, it just goes right to the discard pile rather than increasing the rage meter. Doing the effect then causes the certain consequences to happen, in which case it does five damage to this enemy, and this and the card that would be uh, below it flip over. Step two of a player's turn, scene activation. Once the hero has finished their hero activation turn, that player reveals the top card of the upgrade deck. In the upper right-hand corner is a Norse rune symbol. These rune symbols correspond with the matching symbols within the scene, and that means that that card activates during the scene. So in this situation, because we have this right here, these two cards would activate, meaning these two enemies would attack. A variety of effects could happen, such as enemies attacking, special events occurring, or even enemies respawning. If multiple cards have the same rune on them, they are activated from left to right, top to bottom. Enemy attacking is the most common activation. Enemies have the same two types of attacks as heroes do, melee and ranged. A melee attack will show how much damage it does and the range of the attack. In this case, it attacks the column right here and the column to the right of it. So Kratos would get hit by this enemy if they activated. Ranged attacks will target the character furthest from the enemy's position. So in this case, this enemy would go after Kratos because they are one, two cards away, and this enemy would go after Freya because she is one, two, three cards away. Thing to remember, only the hero in the front row will be taking the attack from the enemy. So if Kratos and Atreus were in this row and Kratos was in front, Atreus would take no damage from any enemy attacks incoming to this particular spot. During this time, heroes may play the blue shield cards in order to reduce incoming damage from enemies. Black number cards or any type of number modification may be used in order to increase the value of the block, reducing the damage further. If a hero's accumulated damage is equal to or greater than their max health, then that character is knocked out and they can no longer act during the scene. But they still must do a scene activation during their turn. So basically they skip their hero activation scene completely. If all heroes are knocked out, then it's game over. After the player has completed their scene activation, the card that has been revealed is just placed to the side, and we will come back to that later during the upgrade phase, and then the next player takes their hero action, then followed by a scene action, followed by the next player's action, and so on and so forth. Phase 3, Extra Scene Activation Phase. After all the heroes have done their hero turn along with their scene activations, there is one extra scene activation that happens at the end of the round. So what you're going to have here is a pile of cards from all the scene activations that is equal to the number of players plus one. Phase four, the upgrade phase. The final step in the round is the upgrade phase. Starting with the first player, they have two options. The first is to look at what cards have been revealed during the scene activation steps and choose one of them to place on top of their activation deck. In this deck builder, these would actually go on top, preparing it for the next round. Second choice is, instead of choosing one of these cards, they may permanently remove one card from their discard pile from the game, helping thin out their deck and able to draw better cards. This is also the time that you're able to get rid of any negative stats that you have acquired throughout the course of the scene, meaning you can get rid of a poison card, a stun card, or if you happen to collect a shattered crystal and you want to get rid of that too, you can do that during the upgrade phase instead of taking one of the upgrades. After all players have taken one of the cards or have removed something from their deck that they didn't want, the remaining cards are then placed on the bottom of the upgrade deck, 
the first player token is passed to the next player, and a new round of play begins starting with the preparation phase. Rounds will continue to follow this flow of phases and steps until all heroes have completed the scene by finishing the winning condition, or they lose by everyone being knocked out, or the lose condition has been met. After the first quest has been completed, all players will remove all poison, stun, and shattered crystals from their deck. These are the only cards that are removed from the deck at the end of the quest. Any other cards acquired during the upgrade phase stay in the deck for the next two quests. In addition, their players get a full heal back to full, and their rage is set to zero. We can set this off to the side for now. Then we go back to the pyramid here. The first quest has been completed, so that is removed. You don't get anything else from that. Moving up to the next step, the players then determine which one of the two quests they wish to tackle. They will discuss amongst themselves based on how they have grown their decks in order to determine which ones they are most comfortable going up against. Once they have chosen which one they will be facing, they are going to flip over the other one. Flipping it over actually reveals a little bit of flavor text about what happens by not doing this quest, but more importantly shows a hindrance in which all players have to adhere to. In this case, it says, before the first round, each hero takes one damage. Not so bad in considering, but these get a lot worse. Then, just like in the first round, they're going to find the scene with the number on it, set that up, and play that as normal, continuing to build their decks, and of course, working towards the win conditions and not doing any of the lose conditions. If the players happen to get a hindrance that talks about removing cards from their deck, these cards are just set to the side, because after the quest is done, those cards are then shuffled back into the hero's deck. Either way, after beating this, then the players are on to the final boss section. Just like with the second quest, the players are going to choose which one of these three they will be going up against, and once they have come to agreement, the other two are flipped over, and the hindrances that are listed on those cards are then applied to this fight. The players then go into this, setting up the cards as normal, playing through them, going through the rounds in order to defeat the final boss. If they satisfy the win condition, they have won the game. If all the players have lost or a lose condition has been met, then they lose. Status ailments and shattered crystals. I'm going to be going over a few of the more random details of the game. First are the status ailments. Poison is an effect that can be applied by enemies. Once a poison has been successfully put into a player's deck, it goes right on top, and the effect is, is when you draw it, you discard it, but then you immediately take one damage and draw another card. The more poison in your deck, the more damage you're going to deal to yourself as you go on. In order to successfully get poison, the enemy must deal damage to the hero, meaning that if you block an attack completely that's supposed to poison, you do not get the poison card. As with stun, the only way to remove this from your deck during the game is during the upgrade step by instead of taking a card and adding it to your deck, you can remove it permanently from it. The stun ailment comes in two different types, stun from an enemy and stun from the heroes. Some heroes do have attacks that apply stun to the enemy, and for a hero to successfully stun them, they do not have to cause damage to them. They just have to attack them. You place the stun token on the stun enemy, and the next time that enemy would activate, you simply remove the token from them instead of performing an action. When an enemy stuns a hero, they have to do damage to them in order for the card to be added to their deck. Just like all cards that are added to the deck, it is placed on top, and then when it's immediately drawn, you do what it says. In this case, you discard this, and that's it. You do not draw another card, so effectively this lowers your hand limit. Just like with the poison, the only way to get rid of stuns from your deck is to use the second part of the upgrade action to discard from your hand instead of actually taking from any of the availables. Shattered crystals are special items that heroes acquire during some scenes. Depending on the scene, they are either used in combat with enemies or to achieve specific quest goals. When acquired, like all other cards, the Shatter Crystal goes on top of the player's deck and is drawn during their next preparation phase. Shatter Crystals themselves have the ability where you can discard this card to draw a card if you don't need it for anything in particular. Like Stuns and Poisons, you can get rid of these through the upgrade phase, meaning that you can get rid of it instead of taking one of the upgrades, or 
all three of them will be permanently removed from your deck at the end of a quest. The back of the instruction manual has a handy guide for the various steps that you would go through on each round of the game, and then icon references as well. Solo mode. This is the mode that I will be playing this game on my channel, so you're going to see more about how this works over there. But each one of these characters has an alternate side to them that represents solo mode. In solo mode, the player will always be playing as Kratos, so only his standee will be used, and Atreus and Mimir will be used as support characters. In solo mode, Kratos' rage ability changes slightly for the mode, and Atreus and Mimir each gain new abilities to aid Kratos in the quests. Atreus and Mimir each have two abilities with two options each. These abilities can be used once, and a common token can be used in order to indicate that the ability has been used. The only way to gain this ability back is to use Kratos' new Spartan Rage ability, which still does the 3 damage and the 3 heal, but also refreshes all ally abilities, meaning that the ability is able to be used once again. Otherwise, the game plays out as normal. Kratos will get his turn, playing out however cards he wants to go. Then the scene activation happens, where one card is played, and then the scene activates again, so the scene actually activates twice. Kratos would then choose one of the two cards that were drawn in order to upgrade his deck during the upgrade phase. He will then go back into preparation and continue on that way until he either wins or loses using himself and the abilities given by Atreus and Mimir. And there you have it, how to play God of War the card game. Again, as I said earlier in the video, if you have any questions at all, please be sure to leave them down in the comments below. I will get back to you as soon as I can with hopefully a good answer. Uh, there's always great things on BGG to check out as well. Plenty of places out there to still find answers for some of the more quirky things about this game. As I mentioned in the video, up next for me with this game is to do a full solo mode playthrough of the game, Kratos with Atreus and Mimir as the support characters. That would be two scenes going through, and then ultimately beating the final boss. Each scene will be its own episode, so be sure to catch those out as they're released, or check them all out at once, once they're done, you know, binge straight through them, or do both, that'd be cool too, I'm alright with that. Either way, be sure to subscribe to the Home Gamer Dad so you don't miss any future playthroughs of this or any other games I have, or any of the fun stuff that I happen to put out. Guys, thank you always so much, you guys are amazing. Be kind to yourselves and each other. We are family forever gaming together with some of the coolest dads ever, like me, like Kratos, like any of you out there. Moms, dads, siblings, it doesn't matter who you are. Stay awesome. I will see you guys in the next one. Take care. Later.